Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to National Lead Prevention Poisoning Week. This is our kickoff event here in the city of Cleveland. We are so delighted that all of you have come out, our partner organizations, friends, allies, and partners who are all in this together in this effort to educate and inform in the fight against lead. I first learned about lead when I worked at the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. Jeff Patterson, who is the CEO of CMHA, he and I worked there together about 12 years ago, and he is a sale to become the CEO. But that's when we first learned about lead. And he and, his, he and his team have did a remarkable job working in the public housing units and also in the Section 8 unit. We are here really talking about the units that are in the city that are not under CMHA's authority. We are happy to have you as a partner. We've leaned on you, we've called you for advice, and we certainly appreciate you and your team for the insight and the fortitude that you have given us as we have continued to move forward. In recognition of National Lead Prevention Poisoning Week, the Cleveland Department of Public Health has planned several events, events throughout this week, throughout this city. All of the events are to raise awareness, to stress the importance of screening, to increase the number of children that are screened so that we can put prevention and intervention programs in place, so that we can educate and inform parents, so that we can curtail the negative events, the consequences of lead. We know that those consequences can have profound negative impacts, and we need to get in front of that. We need to get in front of that. As a delegated authority, to, to the State of Ohio Department of Health, our responsibility is to investigate once a child is identified. So this is after the fact. But the Cleveland Department of Public Health has worked very closely with partners in and around our community, and you'll hear more from the director and the commissioner, so we can get in front of this, so that we can be proactive about this because we know that the number of homes in the city of Cleveland built before 1978 is a large number. So we want to get in front of that. Mayor Jackson, two years ago, created the Healthy Homes Interdepartmental Initiative. That initiative is composed of four departments, Community Development, Cleveland Department of Public Health, Building and Housing, and Law. It is that interdisciplinary group, that interdepartmental knowledge, wisdom, experience, working together so that we can get in front of that. It's the first time ever we've had that type of interdepartmental initiative. I see member, many members of the staff of all those departments, and we are in this working together, decreasing the silos so that we can have a multiplier effect in the programs, the ideas, and the strategies that we put forth. Because of issue 32 that the voters voted on a year ago, we were able to expand the number of staff in the Cleveland Department of Public Health, the Cleveland Department of Building and Housing, and with new grants in community development, we are adding to the programs that we have to combat this historic age challenge that we have in this community. Lead is not new, it's been here. It's been here. It's a decades old problem. But we believe we have, for the first time, an interdepartmental initiative so that we can, in a very smart way, deal with this issue, be proactive in the housing and the protection of our children as we move forward. Mayor Jackson, with the issue 32, he allowed the CDBH budget to expand to more than $1.5 million. So we expanded the staff in the Cleveland Department of Public Health in other areas because public health is interested in being in front of the challenges. Our lead program has gone through a complete restructuring, new leadership with our commissioner who is well experienced and has high reputation in and across the state and even across the country when you start thinking about the Centers for Disease Control. Those items are critically important. They're critically important for the energy and the direction that we are going forward. We've did enough, a lot, but it's not enough. 
We have laid the groundwork, and we will continue to build strategies and work with our partners and listen to parents and listen to other programs so that we can, in a very smart way, deal with this issue. At this time, I'd like to give, on behalf of Mayor Jackson, a proclamation to the director of the Cleveland Department of Public Health, Meryl Gordon. And essentially, this is a proclamation acknowledging Lead Week, October 22nd through October 28th. And the mayor goes on to say, and I'm just going to use a Cliff Notes version, on behalf of the citizens of this great city, he's dedicating this week to Lead Week, National Lead Week, so that Director Gordon, along with the other directors of those departments that I mentioned, can work together to combat this challenge that we have in this community. She and her team and so many partners have worked very hard, very diligently, and we will continue to do that so that we can protect our children, protect our homes, promote health, and promote healthy neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Walker Miner. I really appreciate that. On behalf of the entire Department of Public Health, Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for acknowledging National Lead Week. For the health department, every week is Lead Week. For some of us, every day is Lead Day. Um, this fall, we just signed another agreement with the state of Ohio to be a delegated authority, so our work continues to investigate its, all the properties in the city of Cleveland associated with a child who has an elevated blood lead level of 10 micrograms per deciliter or higher. Um, but we know that that's on the opposite side of it. We are really working on the proactive side of it and anxious to continue to work with our partners so that we can identify and prevent lead poisoning before it happens. As the chief mentioned, our team has grown, and I just want um, those of you here who um, are part of the lead program at the Cleveland Department of Public Health to stand for a moment and be recognized. Our Commissioner Brian Kimball, our Deputy Commissioner Patrick Kusick, Karen Detmer, Monet Watley, Susan Friend, Irene Azari, Teresa Davis Bowling, Claudia Miser, Abraham Iwas, and Aaron Nalon. Thank you all. For those of you who've dedicated your life to this work and for those of you new to it, you know how important this work is, and we really, really thank you for your service. We also continue to contract with Joe Audi, who helps us with all of the investigations out in the community and works along with our team as well to really educate and inform families when we're out in the community of what is a source of lead poisoning and how to uh, remediate it. This is such an important relationship to have and we really, really appreciate that human touch um, that you bring to this work so that families can do all that they can to help um, prevent um, additional poisoning in their children to others who are in that home. Um, as you may know, um, we have been in the news quite a bit regarding our program and, um, and what we have done in the last two years since um, some of this has been um, brought up again is we've worked diligently on our backlog cases. We are now less than 100 cases to go um, in the backlog of those from 2003 to 2014. So there's been a reduction of more than 80% of those backlog cases, which is a significant milestone for the health department because we're also keeping up with the current cases. So it's a huge lift, but we are here to do this work, and that is what we are committed to. Um, we've implemented additional efforts to track down property owners and children, and we will continue to do that and expand that work because that is so critical to making sure that we are protecting our children. 
This work has never been done and never been successful in isolation. I also want to thank our partners in building and housing, in community development, in the law department, and in public utilities who've been working with us tirelessly in the Healthy Homes Interdepartment Initiative so that we can really work on this issue collectively. Um, last week, Commissioner Kimball and I um, spent some time going through some old documents in a storage room and um, found a number of, um, of the old floppy disks and a number of VHS drives and a number of boxes of very, very old documents that were probably perhaps 15 years old and older. And there were so many. Um, regarding lead and so many new ideas that were brought to the table, so many um, collaborative uh, proposals on how to address lead. And it really, really struck me yet again that this issue in this legacy city, this city that was built on manufacturing and industry where a, a number of the byproducts were lead, this city that had um, that is very dense and when we drove around with leaded gasoline in our cars and belted that out and contaminated our communities, we are still and will always need to work on this issue going forward. This isn't new, as the Chief mentioned. This just continues to be our work, and we continue to be committed to making sure that we are protecting our children, protecting our families. It's hard work, and it's complicated work, because there really continues to be this issue. And as a, as a, a property that we can invest in and make sure is lead free, we can open up the door and dust can come in again and it can, again, impact children. So we really need to make sure that everybody is on board as we learn about ways that um, lead can impact children and what, what everybody can do collectively to try to mitigate um, any of that exposure to children. Um, I wanted to um, acknowledge one individual on our team who I don't see here. Is Teresa here? I wanted to just make a quick comment about Teresa Davis Bowling, who has been with the health department for about 17 years now. And this, this woman is so dedicated to this work. She's our case manager and um, is never far from her telephone. Um, to receive all those calls from the hospital, to receive all of these um, high EBL cases, and to really be that first voice for families who learn that their child is lead poisoned. The, the compassion and the empathy and the patience that this woman has had over the last 17 years is really, to me, she's a hero in my eyes. She really does do the kind of work that takes time that takes effort, that really takes that human touch so that we can really help families. Because when the city comes knocking on your door to do an investigation or to point things out in your home, and that guilt that you must feel, um, she really helps each and every family work through that. And for that, I really want to commend her and thank her for her work publicly. Before I turn this over to, please thank you. Before I turn this over to our speakers, I would like to call up Commissioner Brian Kimball. He's going to speak to the events from this, um, that are happening this week so we can all continue to learn about lead and what we can do collectively to mitigate these lead hazards. Commissioner Kimball. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Before I start, I do want to commend our staff on working on the backlog. Over the past 18 months that the director mentioned, that's been a, a very, uh, very hard job. And we have two individuals who have been part of this, this whole process during the whole 18 months. And that is Gina and Tyra. If you, if you would stand, I just want to thank you publicly. I really appreciate your dedication. Thank you. So each year, uh, this in October is National Lead Poison Prevention Week, and it's a call to action to bring together all our partners, all our, uh, or in any other organizations that are is involved in lead poison prevention. 
uh, we have aligned ourselves with the, our federal partners, CDC and HUD, who have in the past, lead screening has not been part of Lead Awareness Week. Uh, we have uh, aligned ourselves with our federal partners to do just that. And this week will be a focus on providing screenings in the neighborhoods. So this week, we will, uh, we will be in the neighborhoods walking and talking with families of children that uh, are exposed to lead hazards. We will be providing screenings, free screenings, at recreation centers throughout the city of Cleveland. And I'm going to list some of the uh, locations that we will be at in providing screenings. On Monday, this evening, we will be at Clark Recreational Recreation Center between the hours of 5 and 7, providing lead screenings. We will be walking in that neighborhood to talk with and uh, to, to talk with the community. On Wednesday, October 25th, we will be in the Buckeye area at Rice Library between the hours of 4 p.m. and 6.30 p.m., walking and talking with the families. On Thursday, October 26, we will be in the Broadway area at Stella Walsh Recreation Center between the hours of 5 and 7 p.m. And on Friday, we will be at the zoo, uh, for Boo at the Zoo, providing screenings and education as well. And on Saturday, we have a couple events uh, at the aquarium and at the Science Center where we'll be providing education as well. Again, this is National Lead Awareness Prevention Week. I just want to thank you all for partnering with us and uh, just go out and spread the word. Thank you, Commissioner. In July of this year, Case Western Reserve University received a grant from the Elizabeth Severance Prentice Foundation <clears throat> excuse me, to perform lead testing among Cleveland Metropolitan School District children ages three to six years old. This group was chosen for several reasons, specifically because this is the age where we can do the most to identify them and anybody else in that, in that home who might be at risk. We're really excited to work with CASE and other partners because we realize, as I said earlier, this coordinated approach is really the only way we are going to get to the heart of this issue. Um, I want to bring up um, uh, Dr. Lotus, who's an associate professor at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at CASE and focused on maternal child health and the development of biological rhythms in preterm infants. She studied at Wayne State University and the University of Michigan, where she earned her PhD. I also know that um, Deborah Lotion will be joining um, Dr. Lotus. She is the Director of Health and Nursing Services for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Deborah been, has been a school nurse for at least 28 years and leading the work in the Cleveland schools for approximately 13. We are proud to be one of the many partners in the schools on this and many other public health matters. Please know that we will be taking questions from the audience as well, and as you formulate your questions, please let us know. We'll have cards and pens out so that um, we can collect your questions and um, begin to ask those of, of Dr. Lotus and um, of Deva Lotion. So please, ladies, welcome. Good, I guess, afternoon now, morning, afternoon to everyone. Uh, we want to thank the Office of the Mayor for the opportunity to talk to you today about the Partners in Health. Okay? Okay. Uh, the Partners in Health Lead Screening Project. And I want to thank the Elizabeth Severance Prentice Foundation for the funding that allowed us to begin this project. So the purposes of the project, um, as was just alluded to, is to screen all pre-K and kindergarten, basically three to five year olds, in the Metropolitan uh, School District, Cleveland Metropolitan School District, who have not had a lead screening test within the past year. For clarification, we have been asked why we're screening three to five year olds when they may have been screened at ages one and two. We have a couple of reasons for that. First, we know that from reviewing other programs that children who have been tested with, without elevated lead levels at one and two 
by the time they are three to five, 30 percent have converted to having excessive, excessively high lead levels. And secondly, the period from three to five years of age is a time of rapid brain development. So it's a time when children are particularly vulnerable to the effects of lead. And finally, we know that many children simply have not been tested. The second purpose is to identify those children and then to have them followed uh, with information, support, uh, and facilitating their uh, reaching or getting uh, whatever follow-up help they need, including medical help. We, so the way we're going to do that, and I'll say a little bit more about that later, is we're going to use our graduate students, graduate students in nursing, uh, social work, medicine, and so on, to work with parents on moving them forward and getting help for their children. So our goal is that all children will be tested and treated as necessary. So to do this, we had to form uh, the Partners in Health team. This is a, a team that we formed out of all of the major stakeholders that we felt were essential to move forward. And it was developed as a collaborative effort by this team. The Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, Case Western Reserve, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, the Cleveland Department of Public Health, the Cleveland Office of the Mayor, and the Metropolitan Metro Health School Health Program. So this really is a whole community coming together to help the children. And I want to emphasize the word collaboration. This is a process is one in which every single person at the table made an essential contribution without which we would not have been able to uh, get this project up and moving. So over the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to do three things. We're going to provide some context for the project that I think helps explain why we are, why it was developed the way it was developed and why we'll, we'll function the way it's going to function. Debbie Lotion will identify some of the issues identified in the school district that made us feel that it was imperative that we do this. And then we'll briefly describe how the project will function. So context. Um, as most people know, healthcare is a driver, an economic driver in Northeast Ohio. We have world-class health institutions and they provide some of the best healthcare in the world. Related to that, we have multiple schools of educating health professionals to work in those world-class health facilities. And those schools are educating thousands of students. So keep in mind the thousands of students. And those students, I believe, are enriched by the opportunity to serve the community while they learn uh, and by addressing real life critical problems, critical health problems in the community. I think it's a great learning opportunity for students. And secondly, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District and the undergraduate nursing program uh, at Case have an ongoing 15-year relationship in which nursing students have worked with the CMSD school nurses to address significant health problems. Uh, this includes such things as asthma, hypertension, and many others. So working on lead screening was a natural extension of what we've been doing for the past 15 years. So with that context in mind, I'd like to invite Debbie Lotion to talk about the genesis of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn gives you the facts. I'm going to give you the story. So I'm a natural storyteller. It's, I've been around nursing now for 40 years. I've been in the schools for 31. And from day one, we knew lead was a problem. Children who came to school at age five with lead levels of 60 and above who couldn't walk up steps. They couldn't learn. Kids with high lead levels cannot learn. Now, I have a personal stake in this. I personally think these kids are going to be taking care of me someday. So I want to make sure that they're well enough and can learn enough to do that. And I think we all need to know that. Because these, these kids are the ones that are going to be doing the nursing, running the manufacturers. They're going to be doing all of this. They need to be able to learn this. And lead 
stops that. You know, for years and years and years, lead was a problem in this country per the CDC. And then one day they said it's no longer a problem. And we all went, wait, 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 yeah it is. And then Flint happened. And that focused it back. And that's what we needed. We need, we, unfortunately, we needed a Flint, Michigan to bring us back to task, to make us understand what's going on with our children. We have children who are being identified as special ed, identified as autistic, because of a disease. Lead is a disease. It can be treated. Many parents don't realize that it can be treated. Once you got a diagnosis of lead, it's not a one-time treatment, it's a multi-phase treatment, but it can be treated. We can help these kids get to their potential. And as an educator, I want to see that. You know, I always tell this story, people laugh when I do. Any of you in here who are amateur archeologists or historians, look up the fall of Rome. Well, look what caused the fall of Rome. It was lead. That's a fact. I don't want to see that happen here. We have too many children in Cleveland schools. We have 43,000 kids we're, we're tasked with. Just to get to the kids with the lead problems, we're going to need the collaboration of everybody that's in this room. That's why we kept, as we, what when we started this, we kept pulling people in. And we kept seeing what we, could we mine from their, from their organization? What could we mine from their people? We're still bringing them in. We need parents to understand, one, they need to sign a consent. That's a big one. They need to get that consent signed, but we want to test their kids. It's a free service, and we will help them get treatment. We will show them the resources out there. We will lead them to it if we have to. But we've got to do something because we have kids that are still coming in with lead levels of 30, 40, and over 50. In this day and age, that's ridiculous. We're a large urban area. We have all these people out there. We have world-class care. This is ridiculous. Why should we have these kids with these lead levels coming in still when we know they're out there? So we, Lynn and I talked about this for a very long time. And lead was number one in our books for years. But we couldn't figure out how to pull it together. And thank God for the Prentice Grant. Thank God, because they understood. Our, the, feds, the federal government may not understand too well at this point, but the, Fe, the Prentice Grant did. And it understood where we were coming from and that we needed to go grassroots. We didn't need... We didn't need everybody up here. We needed the people down here going, okay, this is what we are going to do. No matter what happens, this is what we're going to do. We're going to test these kids. We're going to help these little three-year-olds. I don't want to see another kid who can't learn how to walk up steps. And that is a true story. That's tragic, but it was a true story. It took them two years to finally teach them that because of lead. And I'm a Clevelander. I grew up in Tremont. I live in Old Brooklyn now. I'm, I'm, I'm a true, true dyed-in-the-wool Clevelander. I'm going to be going door-to-door -door in my neighborhood going, did you sign your consent yet? <laughs> so that's what we need from all of our partners, to let people know we need consent signed. We need to get out there and do this. It's been ignored for a while. It's been forgotten. But now it's on, thanks to the mayor's office and everybody in this room, it's back, back on task. So we need to keep that going. Madam. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Debbie. So based on the issues that Debbie identified, we moved to a create, develop a collaborative, interprofessional team, the Partners in Health Group. And I didn't do this before, but I want to do it now. We have many members of that team here today. Uh, Tracy Thompson Martin from the Mayor's Office, Brian Campbell, and Pat Kusick from the Health Department, Debbie Aloshan, of course, and Carol Pennington from the School District. And I don't think the Metro Health Group are here, but Katie Davis 
and Vanessa Meyer from the health, from uh, Metro Health School Health Program are also part of our team. So we, the Partners in Health Group came together to plan the program, seek initial funding, and to oversee the implementation of the project. They are continuing to work with the implementation process. Uh, there are a couple of things. We intend not to duplicate efforts that are already being made. There are many people doing great work in relation to lead in the city. We want to complement that and fill a gap that we think exists but we're, we don't want to duplicate what anyone else is doing. We want to work with other people, not duplicate it. So, how will the project work? We'll be utilizing some of those thousands of health professional students that I referred to before. One of the issues about doing anything, lead, anything else, working on a project, is personnel. <clears throat> we have, literally, thousands of nursing students, medical students, social work students, physician's assistants, and so on, who are being trained to work in health and who have a real interest in this kind of a project. And they provide a tremendous number of people uh, to provide the workforce for the project. The previous project we've done, also funded by Prentice Foundation, we train 400 students a year to come into the schools and do the, the screening and so on that we were doing at that point. So we're going to begin by mounting a community parent uh, outreach uh, information education process. We know that other people are working with that and we intend to work with everyone who's out there, but we need to get the parents in the schools that we're targeting to be really aware of this, we must have their informed consent in order to do the testing. So we need, we want them to be really aware and with us on this process. So we'll have professional student, health students, we're going to have nursing and medicine, a number of groups uh, involved in the, um, the educational program, community members, health department, and any, many other groups that are active in Cleveland at this point. We will be providing initial screening of all eligible children through a finger stick process. Uh, this will be done in the schools by undergraduate nursing students, trained and supervised by experienced faculty using an eight to one student faculty ratio and augmented by volunteer professional nurses. And I specify the eight to one student faculty ratio because I've been asked recently whether we're planning to have undergraduate students running amok through the school district. And I want to assure you that our students do not run amok. Uh, they are trained before they come, they are supervised and they come in small groups and they don't run. Um, and it was not the CMSD people who asked. Uh, again, only children whose parents have consented in writing to have their children tested will be included in the screening. After the initial screening, all of the samples will be taken to the health department where they'll analyze them and they'll disseminate the results to all the people who need the results of those screenings. All children with elevated lead levels with the finger stick will then need to have a confirmatory blood test by venous draw. This is the needle in the arm. This will be done by nursing graduate students in pediatrics. These are experienced pediatric nurses and we want people who've had lots of experience doing uh, blood draws on small children with very small veins. And these are the only people who will be doing the venous draws on children. We anticipate that about 20 to 30 percent of the children initially screened uh, are going to show elevated levels, and that about 10 to 20 percent of the children initially screened will ultimately be confirmed with elevated lead levels. We don't know that those percents are correct, but that's, they're a fair estimate based on what we do know. For children who still are showing elevated lead levels, the health department will follow up, uh, the follow-up will be initiated according to their policies. And in addition, again, we're, we want to complement, not duplicate. In addition, the families with children with elevated levels will be contacted by a graduate 
health professional students. We will have trained these people. Actually, we're asking the health department to help with the training. Um, they will act sort of as navigators. They'll work with the families to provide information, uh, to provide ongoing support, and to facilitate them getting whatever help they need at that point. And then Metro Health, where approximately 70% of the CMSD children receive their health care, will be probably one of the, the main referral uh, for many of the students. So our timeline, we're just beginning year one as a pilot year to develop and implement educational programs and trial our training and testing protocols. This fall we're beginning the educational programs and we'll be working with parents to obtain informed consent. In the spring, we will have our first uh, initial screenings. We will be going into about four schools, maybe a few more depending on what we can do. We expect to screen 100 to 200 students or children this year. Uh, and again, if, we have, if we're able to do more, we will do more. We won't do less than that. And then over the next two years, we'll be rapidly increasing the number of schools and children that we screen each year until we reach full capacity. We're reaching out now to multiple groups to work with us on the project. For example, Legal Aid has agreed to provide services to any family uh, that needs it related to lead screening. Our intention over the next three years, with the funding we now have, is to work to institutionalize the process so the testing program that we've established will go on. Yep, anything to... No, I, uh -huh. I just want to make sure that it is carried on. Lynn and I are going to retire someday. We want to make sure that this is carried on after we're gone. This is what our goal is, to make sure it is institutionalized and somewhere along the line, kids keep getting tested before it's too late. And we think that's possible to do. We think in three years we can have it established and it will continue. So we are now open to taking questions. I also have some uh, handouts. It's actually a reprint of the University Daily paper um, article on the project and it describes basically the, the main points of how the project will work. Please get a round of applause um, and thank these two. Thank you. This is really incredibly um, helpful information here and I um, think that this will be such a coup for these children. I um, had a couple questions. Um, first of all, I had one regarding the um, faith-based organizations and have you given any thought on how you can incorporate them in this work? Yes. Uh, we're actually actively seeking additional funding at this point, and one of the intents is that as we have the resources, we will respond, we will move beyond the school district uh, to include Head Start, faith-based institutions, any group that is that we can move with uh, to screen children. There's a question about um, the age that you chose. I know you talked a little bit about this, but can you talk a little bit more on um, why you chose this particular age group and if you would advocate getting tested even earlier than um, the ages you chose? Okay, any child on Medicaid is required to be tested at ages one and two. The reason that we chose the three to five age group, uh, as I alluded to before, is that it is a time of rapid brain development, uh, so the kids are particularly vulnerable at that time. We know that even kids who are negative at one and two often convert and are showing elevated levels in the three to five range. We also know that these children are getting ready to start school, and we know that they will do less well in school, uh, they will struggle much more in school if they have elevated lead levels that are untreated. So we would like to give these children the best chance as they start school as possible. Um, 
So we will not screen children who've been screened within the last year, but we do want to, if we can, get every other child. And one thing is, pre for Clee, we now have kids starting age three in the school's district. They are there. Since they are there in the district, that's the easiest way and the best way to do mass screenings is if we can get them all together. And it does work. And we do want to start that age group because it's young enough, one, where they do have a high lead level, we get them treated. Two, we can figure out if there are special educational needs they need. Um, individual education plan, the IEPs, something that will help them learn even with the boundary until the lead is chelated out or if it's not, how to get them to them with that barrier. The other thing is with that age group, a lot of times there are siblings at home. There are younger children. So if we find out that there's a lead poisoned child in that age group, we might be able to get to those younger kids before there's a problem. And that's a wonderful thing. And we can also then uh, seek permission to also test older children in the family. If we have one child with elevated lead levels, it may be that other children in the family also have elevations. This is just my own question as a follow-up. Um, one of the concerns we have is that um, even if the child is required to be tested at one and two, if their insurance is Medicaid, not all pediatricians do this. So do we have a way that we can work together to try to encourage that additional testing and the, that they comply with um, what's required? One of the things we've talked about is uh, some outreach to pediatricians um, who are seeing the children. We do know that when you go through the health records of the children in the, in the school district, that you find health records where it says uh, lead testing not indicated, lead testing not needed, not medically in, uh, indicated, not needed. It's hard to imagine why someone would think that a child living in Cleveland where we know we have documented high levels of children with elevated lead levels, why anyone would think that you, it would be not indicated to test a child. So we are going to do that. As we get some results, we may use that then to persuade pediatricians that actually this is something that is medically indicated. Thank you. We have a question. Um, uh, projections on future prison beds are based on third grade literacy scores. Over 80% of the Ohio prison population is functionally illiterate and have mental health issues. Please speak on lead poisoning connection between illiteracy, mental health, and mass incarceration and possible intervention opportunities. It's a big question. Okay. Uh, we know there's good statistical evidence that children who are, have elevated lead levels uh, have lower IQs, do less well in school, have more behavioral problems, leave school early, have more uh, contact with more episodes of, of illegal behavior, and are more often incarcerated. Um, we know that that's, that has been statistically determined uh, and it, it holds up when you look at different groups of children. So one of the reasons that we want to really deal with these kids as early as possible is we want to try to avoid having all of that. We'd like them to be literate in the third grade. And they can be. They can definitely be literate, particularly if their lead levels are in the normal range. And what was the end of the question? The last part. Um, the connection between illiteracy, mental health, and mass incarceration between possible intervention opportunities possible intervention opportunities. Uh, well, one of the places that I think um, we have the, uh, an ability to, to contact these kids and intervene is within the school districts, uh, in the elementary school grades where they are there, uh, whether it's uh, the public schools or charter schools or faith-based schools, uh, the children in that age group are predominantly in schools and if we can get to them there and get them in treatment if they need it we may be able then to avoid the later 
uh, behavioral problems, leaving school early, incarceration, and so on. You may not see the results for 25 years, but you got to start somewhere. Every journey starts with one step. This is our step. So I had uh, a question regarding um, once you start collecting this data and start seeing trends, if you start seeing a predominance in a particular school or particular area, have you given any thought to what might be some next steps um, in that? Uh, yes. If we start seeing trends, and we will be looking for trends, and we will be um, collating those trends and, and compiling them to get out to people. We know that there are groups in many areas of the city that are working with um, healthy housing, uh, lead removal, and so on. Uh, Gucci is in the university, Greater University Circle, uh, and they're doing some wonderful work there. There are other groups around the city. The health department's doing wonderful work. Um, so, uh, we will obviously be turning to these partners, people that we believe are that we can affiliate with, people in the community who are doing work already. We know we can't do that. That's beyond the capacity of our, our project and beyond the capacity of what we can do. But there are other people doing it, and we will certainly be communicating with them, directing uh, our statistics and, and any trends we identify to those groups. A question that um, might be um, outside of your scope, but there is a question regarding sources of contamination in the housing, and um, if we're working with pay for success or um, any strategies outside of a medical intervention. And I know that the health department is working on a lot of this, and we work collaboratively with a number of partners. But just wonder if you all have um, some interaction with any of that. Yeah, yeah, this one's mine. No, really, we, we just have the partners. Remember, our scope is just the three to five to six-year-olds. That's all we, we can do at this point. We don't have the money or the, 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 the uh, people for remediation, for anything like that. What we're doing is education. Remember, CMSD is an educational institute. We are doing education. And that we're not only educating kids at this point about lead, we're going to be educating their parents so their parents know what to look for. Every, there, I don't, there's a, every house in the city of Cleveland probably has lead in it at some point because of dust, because of, of exhaust, because of paint. I, and like I said, I live in a 114 year old home we had to remediate. So believe me, there's homes like mine out there all over the place, but we can't get into that. The only thing we can do is test, report, and follow up. But we are going to be pulling. We don't turn partners away, people. <laughs> if you got a group out there that thinks you can help us in some way, call us. But we're going to bring our partners in, and they're going to have to carry on part of this because we really can't. And Obviously, part of the educational program for parents is going to be to identify things that may be causing lead contamination in their homes that they could do something about. For example, the soil may well have high lead levels because of unleaded gasoline, because of a number of, of environmental issues. Uh, as simple as uh, uh, intervention is, as having the children wear shoes outside and then take them off before they come in, washing their hands, washing toys, particularly a lot of the uh, imported toys may have lead-based paint on them. Uh, and that's not necessarily uh, screened for or you know, stopped from, from being sold. So those toys need to be washed carefully before they're given to children. We know that paint, lead-based paint, is the primary source, or one of the very primary sources of lead in Cleveland. So there are things that they can do short of abatement, washing the painted surfaces. Um, there are a number of things that we can suggest to parents to start to relieve or lower the lead levels in their environment or their children's exposure to lead. Speaking of toys, I know that um, we're at something recently where we were talking about Stretch Armstrong, the toy that for those of you who are my generation, we used to pull and uh, 
get into it with my siblings, and then after a while, Stretch Armstrong didn't stretch quite so much and sat in the corner and started to create this little white dust on the outside of him, um, and that, that is lead coming to the surface, and uh, it's just a really fascinating thing to know how prevalent lead is in so many of our, our, our household items, um, even in the cords that plug in your phones and your phone itself. Uh, we have one last question, unless we have any more, if um, Patrick can go around one more time. Um, after a child is identified has a high um, elevated blood level, what kinds of information will you help guide parents and teachers in understanding how to help children who perhaps have been poisoned? Okay, if the uh, identified lead levels are between 5 and 9.9, .9, uh, the parents will be, will have one of our graduate students work with the parents and they will go over all of the things that parents can do to minimize lead exposure in their homes. Uh, they will identify any, any interventions, they will work with the parents on identifying interventions they may use uh, to protect their children. If the levels are 10, that's micrograms per deciliter, if they're over 10, or 10 or over, the health department has uh, procedures, policies that go into effect. We may be involved with those people as a complementary uh, source of information, teaching, and so on, because we'll have students, we imagine that we can have one to 200 students who will work with the parents, will go into the homes if the parents prefer that, meet them somewhere else, meet them at the schools, but to work with them on identifying how they can help their children best and help how they can facilitate getting them into health care. So, Deb, what schools are you picking? <laughs> uh, well, we're going to pick one in Slavic Village. One in the Glenville area, because these two areas have been known to be high lead levels in the past. Remember, data from the state is old. It hasn't been around for a couple of years. But anecdotal data that we have from doctors from children who ages one and two show that these are high lead levels. Also, one other school, will, the schools we picked will be Scranton on the west side, uh, Mound, and then and Fullerton. And also, uh, is it Hannah Gibbons? Yeah, Hannah Gibbons. Gibbons. Marion Sterling. Marion Sterling. The grant that Shirley says for 100 to 200 kids, we're going to try to stretch that out as far as we can to get as many children as we can. And next year, we hope to do half the district, the year after the entire district. This is not a quick process. This is a multi phase project. Again, we may not see results of what's going on for a number of years. But like I said, each, each journey starts with a single footstep. And we had to start somewhere because there is a problem and we needed to address it. And that's what we're going to do. I just wanted to, to say that uh, based on the latest data that we have, which is 2015, uh, fully 25% of the children in the Glenville area demonstrated high excessively high lead levels. So we're, we have real concerns about, particular concerns about some neighborhoods, and we're going to start with those. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lotus and Ms. Aloshin for this very, very informative presentation today. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Martin Thompson, who has been working with the health department now for approximately two years. Her background is in education, and she reminds us almost daily of how necessary it is to really incorporate so many disciplines as we look at all of these interventions around lead and lead poisoning. Um, this isn't this is just one narrow thing. We don't just have one way of looking at it, and one way of addressing uh, addressing this issue. Um, and as anybody in public health knows, there are no boundaries to who can help us and who can partner with public health. But I really want to publicly thank um, Tracy for all of her work and all of her dedication in this area. And while she doesn't officially have the credentials, she is our resident expert in public health. Public health
Led investigator. <laughs> Soon she'll be getting her little award. Thank you, Meryl. Before we close out, I want to give a special thank you to all of our partners who came out today to support us in this particular effort. I want to first ask CTO, Cleveland Tenants Organization, please stand up. Thank you again for coming out today to support us. <laughs> Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority, please stand up. Cleveland Metropolitan School District Early Childhood Office, such a critical partner in this effort. Thank you. The Centers for Families and Children, thank you for coming out today. The Cleveland Division of Water, again, another critical partner in our efforts. The Cleveland Department of Building and Housing and Community Development, which is a part of our Healthy Homes Interdepartmental Initiative. Thank you for coming out today. The Cleveland Department of Health's Moms First Program, LED Program, and Office of Minority Health. Thank you again for coming out. And again, to all of you, thank you so very much for coming out today to show your, show your support in this effort. It takes all of us to make this change and get our children to where they need to be to have bright futures. Thank you again for coming out.